Commander Liu, the officer on duty, initially dismisses the anomalies as sensor glitches. However, as the readings grow stronger and more defined, concern spreads through the command center. Commander, we've got something big incoming, Lieutenant Ramirez says, his voice tight with anxiety as he scrutinizes the data stream. Leo leans over Ramirez's console, eyes widening at the sheer number of unidentified ships emerging from the void. Alert Admiral Steele, Liu orders, and get the fleet mobilized. Admiral Marcus Steele, a seasoned tactician known for his decisive and sometimes unorthodox strategies, receives the alert in his quarters. Within minutes, he is on the bridge, assessing the situation with a practiced eye. The Vorthak fleet, characterized by its ominous, spiked silhouettes and eerie green energy signatures, is unlike any threat humanity has faced before. Prepare all defensive measures and scramble the fighters, Steel commands, his voice steady but urgent. We need to show them we are not to be trifled with. The Vorthak ships advance, their formation tight and disciplined. As they breach the outer defensive perimeter, Earth's fleet responds with precision. Energy beams and missile salvos streak across the void, creating a chaotic ballet of destruction. Despite the humans' valiant efforts, the Vorthak's advanced technology and sheer numbers push them closer to Earth's colonies. On the front lines, Captain Alyssa Torres commands the battleship Endeavor. With her sharp tactical mind and unyielding resolve, she leads her squadron in a fierce counterattack. Target their lead ship, Torres orders. If we can disrupt their command structure, we might slow them down. The Endeavor unleashes a barrage of kinetic and energy weapons, striking the Vorthak flagship. The alien vessel shudders but continues its advance, returning fire with devastating plasma cannons. Human ships reel under the onslaught, but they fight back with unmatched tenacity. As the battle rages, Steel's flagship, the Invictus, maneuvers to support the embattled front line. All ships, focus fire on their left flank, Steel commands. We need to create a gap in their formation. Human and Vorthak ships clash in a brutal exchange of firepower. The void of space is lit by the incandescent glow of exploding vessels and the silent screams of dying men and women. Despite heavy losses, humanity's determination shines through. The Vorthak, initially confident in their superiority, begin to experience unexpected resistance. In the heat of battle, Steele notices a weakness in the Vorthak's formation. Captain Torres, take your squadron and punch through that gap. We need to drive a wedge into their forces. Torres acknowledges and leads her ships in a daring assault. The Endeavor spearheads the attack tearing through the Vorthak lines with relentless precision. The sudden maneuver catches the Vorthak off guard, forcing them to regroup and buy precious time for Earth's forces. Despite the success, the Vorthak remain a formidable foe. Steel realizes that the only way to truly understand their intentions is to capture one of their leaders. He orders a boarding party to target a damaged Vorthak cruiser. Marines, led by Lieutenant Jackson, prepare for a high-risk insertion. The Vorthak, undeterred by their initial skirmish, regroup and set their sights on Proxima Centauri, a strategically vital human colony. News of the impending assault reaches Admiral Steele, who swiftly coordinates a defense with Captain Torres and other fleet commanders. The Endeavor arrives at Proxima Centauri, joining a hastily assembled defensive fleet. The colony's orbital defenses are reinforced, and ground troops prepare for the worst. Civilians are evacuated to secure bunkers, creating a tense atmosphere of anticipation. All ships, hold your positions, steel orders over the fleet-wide comms. We can't let them breach our defenses. As the Vorthak fleet enters the system, the humans open fire. Orbital defense platforms and battleships unleash a torrent of weaponry, creating a wall of destruction. The Vorthak respond with equal ferocity, their plasma cannons carving through the void. Captain Torres aboard the Endeavor coordinates her squadron with precision. Focus fire on those frigates trying to flank us. We need to keep their formation tight. The battle escalates, with both sides suffering heavy losses. The void is filled with the debris of destroyed ships and the silent aftermath of deadly engagements. Despite the chaos, human resilience and strategy begin to turn the tide. On the surface of Proxima Centauri, ground forces led by Major Elena Park brace for an inevitable Vorthak landing. 
the colonists, armed and ready, join the soldiers in defending their home. The sky above is a spectacle of fire and fury as ships exchange deadly salvos. We hold this line, Major Park declares to her troops. No alien sets foot on our soil without a fight. The Vorthak deploy ground troops, and the battle shifts to the planet's surface. Park's forces engage in brutal combat, utilizing advanced weaponry and guerrilla tactics. The colonists' knowledge of the terrain gives them a critical edge. Meanwhile, in orbit, the Endeavor faces a critical moment as a Vorthak dreadnought targets the colony. Torres, recognizing the threat, makes a bold move. Divert all power to forward shields and engines. We're taking that ship head on. The Endeavor charges the dreadnought, its weapons blazing. The two ships clash in a cataclysmic exchange of firepower. Torres's gamble pays off as the dreadnought is critically damaged and veers off course, crashing into a nearby moon. With the Vorthak fleet in disarray, Admiral Steele seizes the opportunity. All units, press the attack. Drive them out of our system. The coordinated assault pushes the Vorthak into a full retreat. Human ships chase the fleeing aliens, ensuring they do not regroup for another assault. Proxima Centauri is saved, but the cost is steep. In the aftermath, Steele convenes with his commanders. The victory, though hard-fought, is merely a prelude to the greater war that lies ahead. The intelligence gathered from Zorak reveals that the Vorthak will not stop until humanity is utterly defeated. Captain Torres, battered but unbroken, stands beside Steele. We pushed them back this time, Admiral, but they'll be back. We need to be ready. Steele nods, determination etched on his face. We will be, Captain. For every battle they bring, we'll be there to meet them. This is far from over. The captured Vorthak officer, Zorak, is escorted under heavy guard to the interrogation chamber aboard the Invictus. The room is stark and intimidating, designed to break even the most resilient captives. Admiral Marcus Steele and Dr. Samuel Patel, the xenopsychology expert, prepare for a challenging session. Begin, Steele commands, his voice firm and unyielding. Zorak sits defiantly, his alien eyes glinting with contempt. You cannot break me, human. Dr. Patel steps forward, his demeanor calm and methodical. We shall see about that, he says softly, starting the interrogation process. Patel employs a combination of psychological tactics and advanced neural probes to delve into Zorak's mind. Hours pass, the tension in the room thickening with every moment. Zorak's resolve begins to waver as Patel's probing questions and relentless techniques peel away his defenses. The Vorthak officer's expression shifts from defiance to uncertainty, then to fear. Steele watches intently, waiting for the right moment. Finally, Zorak breaks. Enough, he snarls. I will tell you what you want to know. Dr. Patel nods to Steele, who steps forward. Why have you invaded our space? What is your ultimate goal? Zorak's voice trembles as he speaks. The Vorthak seek to dominate and expand. Your species poses a threat to our supremacy. Our leaders believe that by crippling your key colonies, we can force your submission. Steele leans in, his gaze piercing. Which colonies are your targets? How many more fleets are coming? Zorak hesitates, but the fear of further interrogation compels him to answer. Several of your outer colonies are marked for annihilation. Proxima Centauri was just the beginning. More fleets are en route, each more powerful than the last. The gravity of Zorak's words hangs heavy in the room. Dr. Patel continues to extract details, learning about Vorthak fleet movements, command structures, and the psychological makeup of their species. This invaluable intelligence provides the UEF with the strategic insights they desperately need. With the interrogation complete, Steele addresses his senior officers. We have the information we need. Prepare to relay this to all UEF command centers. Every colony must be ready for an imminent assault. Dr. Patel, weary but satisfied, adds, We also need to understand their weaknesses. The Vorthak psyche is not as unbreakable as they believe. This knowledge will be crucial in the battles to come. Admiral Steele embarks on a mission to unify the various human factions and colonies. The first stop is Mars, the second largest human settlement, where Governor Elena Vasquez presides. Mars boasts significant strategic resources and military assets, making its cooperation essential. 
Steel arrives on Mars amidst tight security, the atmosphere tense with the looming threat of Vorthak invasion. He meets Governor Vasquez in her office, a high-tech hub overlooking the sprawling Martian cityscape. Admiral Steele, Vasquez greets him, her tone formal but welcoming. We received your urgent request. What exactly are we facing? Steele wastes no time. Governor, the Vorthak are planning a series of coordinated attacks on key colonies, including Mars. We need to unify our defenses and resources to stand a chance against their overwhelming force. Vasquez considers his words carefully. Mars has always supported Earth's efforts, but this level of cooperation will require concessions. Our resources are stretched thin as it is. Steele nods, anticipating her concerns. I understand, Governor. In exchange for Mars's support, the UEF will ensure priority access to new defense technologies and supply lines. Our mutual survival depends on our ability to work together. Vasquez leans back, contemplating the proposal. Very well, Admiral. Mars will stand with the UEF, but I expect full transparency and collaboration moving forward. With Mars on board, Steele's next task is to secure the allegiance of the Outer Rim colonies. These distant settlements often operate with a degree of autonomy and skepticism toward UEF directives. Steele contacts key colony leaders through secure channels, arranging a virtual summit to address the Vorthak threat. The virtual meeting brings together representatives from various colonies, each displaying varying degrees of concern and readiness. Steele addresses the group, his tone authoritative and urgent. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vorthak threat is real and imminent. We cannot afford to face this alone. We must pool our resources, share intelligence, and coordinate our defenses if we are to survive. A rugged-looking man, Governor Harris of the mining colony Titan, speaks up. Admiral, we've always valued our independence. What assurances do we have that this alliance won't infringe on our autonomy? Steele responds with conviction. Governor Harris, this is not about control. It's about survival. The UEF will respect each colony's governance while ensuring we all benefit from collective security. United, we can stand against the Vorthak. Divided, we fall. The debate continues, but Steele's argument prevails. The colonies agree to form a united defense pact, with each contributing ships, troops, and resources to the collective effort. This newfound unity strengthens humanity's position, but Steele knows they must act quickly to bolster their defenses. Meanwhile, Steele's team uncovers troubling evidence of a Vorthak spy network operating within human territories. The spies have been gathering intelligence and sabotaging key installations, threatening the fragile alliance. Commander Nora Hayes, Steele's second-in-command, is tasked with rooting out these infiltrators. Hayes assembles a team of elite operatives, launching covert operations to dismantle the Vorthak network. They conduct raids, intercept communications, and employ advanced counterintelligence techniques. The operation is perilous, with several close encounters and intense firefights. One night, during a high-stakes raid on a suspected Vorthak safehouse, Hayes and her team find themselves in a deadly trap. The ensuing battle is fierce, with the operatives using every ounce of their training and skill to survive. Despite the danger, they manage to capture a key Vorthak agent who possesses critical information about the spy network's operations. Interrogating the captured agent, Hayes uncovers the full extent of the Vorthak infiltration. The information leads to a series of coordinated strikes against remaining cells, effectively crippling the spy network. This victory restores a degree of trust among the human factions and ensures the integrity of their defenses. All units, prepare for immediate engagement, Vasquez orders through the comms. This is not a drill. We must protect our home at all costs. Admiral Marcus Steele, now in orbit above Mars aboard his flagship Invictus, coordinates the defense from space. Captain Torres, take the Endeavor and intercept their forward assault. We need to buy time for the ground defenses to activate. Torres acknowledges and leads the Endeavor into the fray. The ship's weapons blaze as they engage the Vorthak ships head-on. The Martian orbital defenses, a network of heavily armed satellites and ground-based missile systems, come to life, launching a barrage of firepower at the invaders. On the surface, 
Major Elena Park commands the ground forces, a mix of UEF soldiers and Martian militia. Set up defensive perimeters around key installations, Park instructs. We can't let them gain a foothold. The Vorthak deploy ground troops in massive dropships, which descend through the Martian atmosphere under heavy fire. Explosions light up the sky as anti-aircraft batteries target the descending enemies. Some dropships are destroyed before they hit the ground, but others make it through, disgorging waves of alien soldiers. Park's forces engage the Vorthak in brutal combat amidst the red Martian dust. Advanced human tanks and exosuits clash with Vorthak war machines, while infantry units exchange relentless gunfire. The Martian militia, driven by the desire to defend their homes, fight with unmatched ferocity. In orbit, the space battle intensifies. Steele's tactical brilliance shines as he directs the UEF fleet to exploit weaknesses in the Vorthak formation. Focus fire on their command ship, he orders. We need to disrupt their coordination. The combined might of the UEF fleet and Martian defenses slowly turns the tide. The Vorthak flagship, a massive dreadnought, sustains critical damage under the relentless assault. As it begins to retreat, the Vorthak forces lose cohesion, making them vulnerable to concentrated counterattacks. On the ground, Major Park and her soldiers push the Vorthak back, reclaiming lost territory. We're not done yet, Park shouts, rallying her troops. Keep pushing until we've driven them off our planet. The Vorthak, realizing their assault is failing, begin a hasty retreat. Human forces pursue them, ensuring no Vorthak soldiers remain. The sky clears of enemy ships as the last of the Vorthak fleet jumps to hyperspace. In the aftermath, Mars stands battered but unbroken. The cost of victory is high, with many lives lost and significant damage to the colony. Governor Vasquez addresses the survivors, her voice filled with both sorrow and resolve. We have faced the storm and emerged victorious. Mars will rebuild, stronger than ever, in the wake of the Vorthak's failed siege on Mars. Intelligence reports indicate the existence of a rebel human fleet operating on the fringes of known space. These renegades, disillusioned by the United Earth Federation's policies, have formed their own faction under the leadership of the enigmatic Captain Rook. Admiral Steele, recognizing the potential value of these skilled but wayward fighters, sets out to bring them into the fold. Accompanied by a small task force, Steele ventures into uncharted space to locate the rebel fleet. The journey is fraught with danger as the task force navigates through asteroid fields and unregulated territories teeming with pirates. After weeks of searching, Steele's ships detect the presence of the rebel fleet near an abandoned mining colony. He establishes contact, requesting a meeting with Captain Rook. The rebels, suspicious and cautious, agree to a parley on neutral ground. The meeting takes place in the remains of the mining colony, a derelict facility filled with echoes of the past. Steele and his team, armed but not hostile, approach the rebel contingent. Captain Rook, a hardened and charismatic leader, steps forward to greet them. Admiral Steele, Rook says, his voice laced with mistrust. What brings you to our corner of the galaxy? Steele meets Rook's gaze, his expression earnest. Captain Rook, Humanity is facing an existential threat. The Vorthak won't stop until they've conquered us all. We need every available ship and every capable fighter to stand a chance. Rook narrows his eyes. And what makes you think we want to fight for the UEF? We've seen how they treat their own. We're better off on our own. Steele steps closer, his tone imploring. This isn't just about the UEF. It's about the survival of our species. Join us and you'll be fighting for all of humanity, not just for a government. Together, we can turn the tide. Rook's eyes flicker with a mix of emotions. He turns to his second-in-command, Lieutenant Zara, who nods subtly. After a tense silence, Rook speaks again. Very well, Steele. We'll join your fight, but know this. We retain our autonomy. We fight on our terms. Steele nods, relief washing over him. Agreed. Welcome to the Alliance, Captain Rook. With the Rebels now allied, Steele integrates their fleet into the UEF's strategic plans. The Rebel ships, though fewer in number, bring unique capabilities and unconventional tactics that prove invaluable. Steele and Rook, despite their initial differences, 
develop a mutual respect as they prepare for the next phase of the war. Together, they launch a series of daring raids on Vorthak's supply lines and outposts, using the rebels' knowledge of fringe space to their advantage. These operations disrupt the Vorthak's logistical support, buying time for humanity to regroup and strengthen its defenses. During one particularly risky mission, Steele and Rook lead a joint strike team deep into Vorthak-controlled space. Their target, a Vorthak research facility developing advanced weaponry. The mission is a high-stakes gamble, with the potential to shift the balance of power. The human ships approach the facility under cloak, avoiding detection until the last moment. They launch a surprise attack, with boarding parties breaching the facility's defenses. Inside, Steel, Rook, and their teams face fierce resistance from Vorthak soldiers and automated defenses. In the heart of the facility, they discover a prototype of a Vorthak superweapon, a massive energy cannon capable of destroying entire fleets. Realizing the catastrophic potential of such a weapon, Steel orders its immediate destruction. Rook, demonstrating his tactical genius, devises a plan to overload the facility's power core causing a chain reaction that will obliterate the entire installation. The teams work frantically, planting charges and fighting off waves of Vorthak reinforcements. With seconds to spare, they evacuate the facility as the charges detonate. The resulting explosion is visible from orbit, a brilliant flash signaling their success. The destruction of the superweapon is a significant blow to the Vorthak's war effort and a major victory for humanity. Captain Alyssa Torres, is selected to lead this high-risk mission. Her team, composed of the best soldiers and intelligence officers humanity has to offer, prepares for the journey. They board the stealth frigate Shadow Dancer, a ship equipped with advanced cloaking technology and state-of-the-art weaponry. As the Shadow Dancer enters Vorthak space, the tension aboard is palpable. The crew knows that discovery would mean certain death. Torres briefs her team one last time. Our mission is simple. Get in, gather intel, and get out. We will be facing the heart of the Vorthak war machine. Stay sharp. The frigate weaves through asteroid fields and bypasses Vorthak patrols, finally arriving at their target, a massive Vorthak command station orbiting a barren, storm-ridden planet. The station is a hive of activity, with ships constantly docking and departing. Using the Shadow Dancer's cloaking capabilities, Torres and her team managed to slip through the station's defenses and dock undetected. They disembark swiftly, moving with military precision through the labyrinthine corridors of the station. The team encounters numerous Vorthak soldiers and automated defenses. Each engagement is quick and brutal, with the humans using advanced tactics and superior firepower to maintain the element of surprise. As they progress deeper into the station, they find a central command hub filled with data terminals. Lieutenant Sarah Kim, the team's tech expert, hacks into the Vorthak systems. Admiral, we've got access to their command protocols and fleet movements, she reports, downloading everything now. While Kim works, the rest of the team sets charges around the hub to cover their escape. Suddenly, the station's alarms blare, an indication that their presence has been detected. Vorthak reinforcements flood the corridors, forcing Torres and her team to fight their way back to the Shadow Dancer. The firefight is intense, with plasma bolts and laser fire illuminating the dark corridors. The team reaches the docking bay, only to find it heavily guarded. Torres signals her second-in-command, Sergeant Mike O'Hara, to provide covering fire as she and the others board the frigate. O'Hara, displaying extraordinary bravery, holds off the Vorthak long enough for the rest of the team to secure their escape. As the Shadow Dancer disengages from the station, the charges planted earlier detonate, causing massive explosions that cripple the Vorthak command center. The Shadow Dancer jumps to hyperspace, narrowly escaping the Vorthak pursuit. Torres breathes a sigh of relief as they return to human-controlled space. The mission has been a success, but the cost is high. They have gained invaluable intelligence, but the losses are deeply felt. Back aboard the Invictus, Admiral Steele reviews the data. This is it, he says, addressing his senior officers. We have the information we need to strike a decisive blow. The Vorthak are vulnerable, and it's time to take the fight to them. Steele mobilizes the UEF fleet 
along with their newly allied rebel ships and Xoranthian forces. The combined armada, a formidable display of unity and strength, makes its way to the binary star system. The plan is to strike swiftly and decisively, crippling the Vorthak's ability to resupply and regroup. As the human and allied ships arrive, they find the Vorthak fleet already entrenched. The system's twin stars cast an eerie glow over the battlefield, their intense radiation and gravitational pull creating unpredictable hazards. Steele addresses the fleet, his voice calm and commanding. All units, maintain formation and follow the battle plan. This is our chance to deliver a significant blow to the Vorthak. The battle begins with a coordinated assault on the Vorthak's outer defenses. Human battleships, supported by agile fighters and bombers, engage the enemy with a ferocity born of necessity. The Vorthak respond in kind, their plasma cannons and energy weapons cutting through the void. Captain Torres, commanding the endeavor, leads a squadron in a daring flanking maneuver. Stick to the plan and use the gravitational anomalies to our advantage, she instructs her pilots. The endeavor weaves through the treacherous environment, using the binary star's gravitational pull to slingshot into the heart of the Vorthak formation. The rebels, under Captain Rook's leadership, launch guerrilla-style attacks on Vorthak supply ships and support vessels. Their unconventional tactics sow confusion among the Vorthak ranks, disrupting their coordination. Rook's flagship, the Raven, proves instrumental in creating chaos behind enemy lines. In the midst of the battle, Steele's flagship, the Invictus, targets the Vorthak command ship. All batteries, concentrate fire on their command vessel, Steele orders. The combined firepower of the Invictus and its escorts pummels the Vorthak flagship, creating a critical breach in their defenses. The battle rages on, with ships from both sides taking heavy damage. The binary star's gravitational forces cause unpredictable shifts, sending some vessels careening off course or into deadly collision courses. The human and allied fleets, however, use these challenges to their advantage, turning the environment into a weapon. Steel identifies a critical moment when the Vorthak fleet begins to falter. Now's our chance. Press the attack and drive them out of the system, he commands. The UEF and allied ships surge forward, overwhelming the Vorthak with a relentless onslaught. Captain Torres and her squadron exploit a gap in the Vorthak defenses, targeting their main supply depots. The Endeavor's precision strikes cause massive explosions, further crippling the Vorthak's ability to sustain their fleet. The Vorthak, realizing their position is untenable, begin a retreat. Steel orders the fleet to pursue, ensuring they do not regroup. The Vorthak ships attempt to flee through the hazardous environment of the binary stars, but many are caught and destroyed by the pursuing human and allied forces. As the last of the Vorthak ships jump to hyperspace, the battle is won. The binary star system, once a critical Vorthak stronghold, lies in ruins. The victory is hard fought and costly, but it marks a turning point in the war. Steel addresses his fleet his voice filled with pride and determination. Today, we have shown the Vorthak that humanity will not be easily defeated. We have struck a blow from which they will not easily recover, prepare for the next phase. This war is far from over. But today, we have taken a significant step towards victory. Commander Nora Hayes, Steele's trusted second-in-command, begins to uncover irregularities in resource allocations and suspicious communications linked to Ivanov. The investigation is delicate. One wrong move could tip off the conspirators and plunge the fragile alliance into chaos. Hayes assembles a covert team of loyalists, including intelligence officer Lieutenant Sarah Kim and field operative Sergeant Mike O'Hara. Together, they delve deeper into the web of deception, tracking encrypted messages and shadowy transactions. Their efforts lead them to a high-profile gala in the heart of Earth's capital, where Ivanov is set to meet his Vorthak contact. Disguised and armed with hidden surveillance equipment, Hayes and her team infiltrate the gala. The opulent event is filled with Earth's elite, oblivious to the treacherous dealings happening under their noses. As they navigate the crowded ballroom, Hayes spots Ivanov slipping away to a secluded garden. Through their surveillance, they witness Ivanov conversing with a hooded figure who is later identified as a high-ranking Vorthak agent. 
The conversation reveals damning evidence of Ivanov's betrayal, plans to sabotage key defense initiatives in exchange for Vorthak promises of power and wealth. Hayes signals O'Hara to move in and apprehend the conspirators. The garden becomes a scene of intense confrontation as Ivanov's hired guards clash with Hayes' team. Despite the chaotic skirmish, they manage to capture Ivanov and the Vorthak agent, securing crucial evidence of the treachery. The fallout is immediate. Ivanov's arrest sends shockwaves through the political landscape. Steele addresses the UEF and the public, ensuring transparency and restoring trust in the leadership. Let this be a reminder, Steele declares, that betrayal will not be tolerated. We stand united against the Vorthak, within and without. The envoys, led by seasoned diplomat ambassador Nadia Jafari, travel to the Zoranthian homeworld aboard the diplomatic vessel Harmony. As they approach the alien planet, the sight is awe-inspiring, a lush world of bioluminescent forests and crystal-clear oceans. The Zoranthians, however, are wary of outsiders and have stringent protocols for visitors. Upon landing, Jafari and her team are greeted by a delegation of Zoranthian officials, their elegant, tall forms adorned in flowing garments. The atmosphere is tense, with both sides cautious yet curious. The initial meetings are formal, with the Zoranthians expressing skepticism about human intentions and the threat posed by the Vorthak. Jafari, known for her adept negotiation skills, presents the case with compelling evidence of the Vorthak menace. We seek not just allies, but partners in preserving peace and life in the galaxy, she says, emphasizing the mutual benefits of cooperation. The Vorthak's aggression threatens all sentient beings. Together, we can stand against this common enemy. Despite her eloquence, the Zoranthians remain hesitant. Their leader, High Chancellor Elara, raises concerns about the long-term implications of such an alliance. We value our sovereignty and peace above all, Elara states. Why should we risk our people for a conflict that may not reach our borders? Jafari remains undeterred. Chancellor Elara, the Vorthak do not respect borders. Their ambition knows no bounds. Today, they attack us. Tomorrow, it could be you. By joining forces, we not only protect our worlds, but send a message that tyranny will not prevail. The negotiations continue for days, with cultural exchanges and demonstrations of mutual respect. Jafari's team showcases human advancements and resilience, while learning about Zoranthian technologies and philosophies. The breakthrough comes when a Vorthak attack on a nearby neutral planet is reported, underscoring the urgency of the Alliance. Moved by the evidence and the shared values of freedom and peace, Chancellor Ilara agrees to a provisional alliance. Let this be the beginning of a new era of cooperation, Ilara announces. Together we shall safeguard the future. The new alliance brings immediate benefits. Zoranthian ships, equipped with advanced stealth and shield technologies, join the UEF fleet. Joint training exercises enhance the combat readiness of both forces, blending human ingenuity with Zoranthian precision. Back on the Invictus, Steele and Jafari discuss the significance of the alliance. This is a pivotal moment, Steele says. We've shown that despite our differences, we can unite for a common cause. The Vorthak will find us stronger and more determined than ever. Jafari nods, her expression one of cautious optimism. The road ahead is still perilous, but with allies like the Zoranthians, we have a fighting chance. With new allies and fortified defenses, humanity and their partners prepare for the next phase of the war against the Vorthak, their resolve bolstered by unity and the promise of a brighter future. The massive armada, composed of human, rebel, and Zoranthian ships, assembles at a staging point just outside Vorthak territory. The fleet is a testament to the unity and resolve of diverse civilizations coming together against a common foe. Steele addresses the gathered forces via a holographic broadcast. Today, we face our greatest challenge, Steele declares, his voice resonating with determination. The Vorthax Doomsday Device threatens all life in the galaxy. We fight not just for our survival, but for the future of all free beings. Together, we will end this threat. The fleet jumps into hyperspace, emerging at the edge of the Vorthak home system. Vortha Prime looms ahead, a dark and forbidding planet encircled by layers of formidable defenses. 
The Allied forces split into strike groups, each with a specific target. Orbital defense platforms, shipyards, and the Doomsday Device Facility itself. Captain Alyssa Torres leads one of the primary assault groups aboard the Endeavor. Her objective is to break through the outer defenses and clear a path for the main fleet. The battle begins with a thunderous exchange of firepower. Human and Xoranthian ships unleash their full arsenal, creating a dazzling spectacle of destruction. Stay tight and keep moving, Torres commands. We need to punch a hole through their lines. The Endeavor and its escorts weave through the Vorthak defenses, their advanced shields and agility proving crucial. Despite heavy resistance, they manage to breach the outer perimeter, allowing the main fleet to advance. On the surface of Vortha Prime, the ground assault begins. Major Elena Park leads the combined human and Xoranthian forces in a daring landing operation. Dropships descend amidst a barrage of anti-aircraft fire, deploying troops and armored vehicles, the landscape of Vortha Prime is harsh and alien, with twisted structures and hostile terrain. Secure the landing zones and push towards the Doomsday Facility, Park orders. We need to move fast. The ground forces engage Vorthak soldiers in intense firefights, using advanced tactics and weaponry to overcome the formidable defenses. The Xoranthians' energy shields and human exosuits prove invaluable in the brutal combat. Slowly but steadily, they advance towards the facility housing the Doomsday device. Meanwhile, Admiral Steele directs the space battle from the Invictus. The Vorthak fleet, though formidable, is gradually worn down by the relentless assault. Steele identifies a critical weakness in their formation. All units, focus fire on their central command ship, Steele commands. If we take it out, their coordination will collapse. The combined firepower of the Allied fleet targets the Vorthak command ship. After a fierce exchange, the massive vessel is destroyed, sending shockwaves through the Vorthak ranks. The loss of their command structure throws the Vorthak into disarray, allowing the Allied forces to press their advantage. On the ground, Major Park and her team reach the Doomsday facility. The structure is heavily guarded with layers of automated defenses and elite Vorthak soldiers. Park devises a plan to breach the facility using synchronized charges and diversionary tactics. Sergeant O'Hara, take your squad and create a diversion at the east entrance, Park instructs. We'll breach from the west and disable their defenses. The plan is executed flawlessly. O'Hara's squad draws the enemy's attention, allowing Park's team to infiltrate the facility. Inside, they encounter fierce resistance, but fight their way to the control center. The Doomsday Device a towering construct of alien technology, looms before them. Captain Torres and her strike team join the ground forces, providing crucial support. Using the intelligence they gathered, they locate the device's weak points and plant explosive charges. As they work, alarms blare, signaling the imminent activation of the device. We're running out of time, Torres shouts. Set those charges and prepare for extraction. The charges are set and the team makes a hasty retreat. As they escape the facility, the explosives detonate, triggering a massive chain reaction. The Doomsday device is destroyed in a spectacular explosion, sending debris and shockwaves across the landscape. The destruction of the device marks a turning point in the battle. The Vorthak, demoralized and disorganized, begin to retreat. Admiral Steele orders a full pursuit, ensuring no Vorthak forces escape to regroup. Press the attack, Steele commands. We must end this threat once and for all. Park and Torres coordinate their forces, organizing a series of precision strikes. We need to root out any remaining Vorthak forces, Park says. Every bunker, every facility must be cleared. The ground troops, supported by air units and orbital bombardments, launch a coordinated offensive. The harsh terrain of Vortha Prime presents challenges with treacherous ravines and hostile wildlife complicating the assault. Despite these obstacles, the combined human and Xoranthian forces press forward with relentless determination. Sergeant O'Hara leads a squad tasked with securing a particularly well-fortified bunker. The approach is fraught with danger, as automated turrets and Vorthak snipers guard the entrance. O'Hara devises a plan to use a captured Vorthak hovercraft as cover advancing under the enemy's own technology. Keep it steady and stay low, O'Hara instructs his squad. Once we're close enough, we'll breach and clear. The plan works. 
The squad reaches the bunker and breaches the entrance with explosive charges. Inside, they face fierce resistance, but use their superior training and coordination to neutralize the defenders. O'Hara's squad moves methodically through the bunker, securing vital intelligence and disabling the facility's systems. Meanwhile, Major Park leads a combined arms assault on a sprawling research complex. The facility, located in a deep valley, is protected by energy shields and heavily armed Vorthak soldiers. Park coordinates an attack that combines ground forces, airstrikes, and orbital bombardment to penetrate the defenses. Concentrate fire on the shield generators, Park orders. Once those are down, we can move in. The shield generators are destroyed in a series of precise strikes, allowing the ground forces to advance. Park's troops, supported by Xoranthian energy shields and human artillery, storm the complex. The fighting is intense, with corridors turning into battlegrounds as they push deeper into the facility. In the heart of the complex, Park's team discovers a Vorthak command center. The Vorthak commander, a cunning and ruthless leader, refuses to surrender. A brutal close quarters battle ensues, with Park leading the charge. The commander is eventually subdued, and the complex is secured. Simultaneously, Captain Torres oversees the assault on the last major Vorthak stronghold, a heavily fortified mountain fortress. Using a combination of stealth and overwhelming force, Torres's team infiltrates the fortress, targeting key infrastructure to cripple the Vorthak's ability to resist. As the ground forces engage the enemy, Torres personally leads a strike team to the fortress's control center. The fighting is fierce, with the team encountering traps and elite Vorthak soldiers. Despite the challenges, they reach the control center and disable the fortress's defenses, signaling the end of organized Vorthak resistance on Vortha Prime. With the main Vorthak strongholds neutralized, the Allied forces conduct thorough sweeps of the planet, ensuring no remnants remain. The victory is comprehensive, but the toll is significant. The Allied forces, though battered, stand victorious on the Vorthak homeworld, marking a decisive turning point in the war. Admiral Steele, Captain Torres, and Major Park assemble an elite strike team for a final assault. The mission is clear. Infiltrate the Vorthak stronghold, eliminate their supreme commander, and dismantle the last vestiges of their war machine. The team includes the best soldiers and specialists from both human and Xoranthian forces, each ready to face the toughest battle yet. The strike team descends into the hostile terrain aboard advanced dropships, navigating through violent storms and treacherous landscapes. The Vorthak stronghold looms ahead, a dark citadel surrounded by heavy fortifications and guarded by elite Vorthak warriors. Steel addresses the team as they prepare to deploy. This is it. Our objective is to bring down the Vorthak leadership and end this war. We fight not just for ourselves, but for the future of every free being in the galaxy. The dropships land under heavy fire, and the team swiftly disembarks, using advanced shields and tactics to push forward. The initial resistance is fierce, with Vorthak soldiers employing advanced weaponry and fortified positions. Despite the intense combat, the strike team's coordination and superior technology give them the edge. Captain Torres leads a contingent through the outer defenses, utilizing her squad's expertise in close quarters combat. Stay tight and watch your corners, she commands. We move fast and hit hard. The team breaches the outer walls, encountering automated turrets and booby traps. Torres' quick thinking and the team's adaptability ensure they neutralize these threats efficiently. Inside the fortress, they find themselves in a labyrinth of dark corridors and fortified rooms. Meanwhile, Major Park directs a parallel assault on the fortress's power generators. We take out their power, we take out their defenses, she instructs her team. The assault is relentless, with Park's forces systematically dismantling the Vorthak's energy supply. The heart of the stronghold is heavily guarded, and Steele's team faces the toughest resistance yet. They engage in brutal firefights employing both strategy and brute force to advance. The team splits into smaller units, each tasked with specific objectives to disrupt the Vorthak's command capabilities. Steele, Torres, and Park finally converge on the central command chamber. The Vorthak Supreme Commander, a towering figure clad in advanced battle armor, stands ready. Humans, the commander sneers, you have come far, but this is where your journey ends. 
the ensuing battle is intense and chaotic. The commander wields advanced weapons and tactics, but Steele's team fights with unmatched determination. Torres and Park coordinate their attacks, using a combination of direct assaults and diversionary tactics to outmaneuver the commander. Steele, seizing an opportunity, engages the commander directly. The two clash in a fierce duel, their weapons and skills evenly matched. Steele's experience and resolve prove decisive as he lands a critical blow, disabling the commander's armor. You may kill me, human, the commander gasps, but you will never defeat the Vorthak spirit. Steele's response is firm. Your spirit is broken and your tyranny ends here. With the commander defeated, the team secures the command chamber, downloading critical data and disabling remaining defenses. The fall of the Vorthak leadership sends shockwaves through their remaining forces, leading to widespread surrender and retreat. With the Vorthak leadership dismantled and their forces in disarray, the Allied fleet consolidates their victory. The immediate threat has been neutralized, but the task of rebuilding and ensuring lasting peace is just beginning. On Vortha Prime, efforts shift from combat to reconstruction and stabilization. Admiral Steele, Captain Torres, and Major Park oversee the disarmament of Vorthak military installations and the repatriation of prisoners of war. The Vorthak, now leaderless and demoralized, begin to cooperate, recognizing the futility of further resistance. Steele addresses the Allied forces and the galaxy at large in a broadcast from the Vorthak stronghold. Today marks the end of a dark chapter and the beginning of a new era. Together we have faced the greatest threat and emerged victorious. But our work is far from over. We must rebuild and forge a lasting peace founded on cooperation and mutual respect. Efforts to rebuild Vortha Prime and other war-torn regions commence immediately. Human and Xeranthian engineers work side by side to restore infrastructure and provide aid to displaced populations. The collaboration deepens the bonds between the allied species, fostering a sense of unity and shared purpose. Captain Torres is appointed as the head of a new exploratory fleet, tasked with seeking out other civilizations and potential allies. Her mission is to ensure that the galaxy remains vigilant and prepared against future threats. We must continue to explore and build bridges, Torres says. Only through understanding and cooperation can we prevent another conflict like this. Major Park leads efforts to establish a joint military academy on Mars where soldiers from different species train together, learning from each other's strengths and experiences. The Academy symbolizes the new era of cooperation and collective security. In the political sphere, new alliances are formalized and a galactic council is established to address interstellar conflicts and foster dialogue. The council includes representatives from humanity, the Xeranthians, and other allied species, each committed to maintaining peace and stability. Admiral Steele, reflecting on the journey and sacrifices made, prepares for his next role as a senior advisor to the Galactic Council. His leadership and vision have been instrumental in uniting diverse factions and achieving victory. The future is in our hands, Steele says. We must honor those we lost by ensuring that their sacrifice was not in vain.